The 9008th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is letter dated 28th February 2014 from the Permanent Representative of Ukraine to the United Nations addressed to the President of the Security Council, S-2014-136. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Ukraine to participate in the meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Ms. Joyce Misuya, Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator, and Mr. David Beasley, Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Programme. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Ms. Joyce Misuya. Madam President, just over a month ago, the war in Ukraine started, and it shows no signs of abating. Children, women, and men are being killed, injured, displaced, and traumatized. Hospitals, homes, and schools are being destroyed. According to the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, as of 27th of March, 1,119 people have died, including 1999 innocent children. We know these numbers are conservative and the tolls are far greater. Cities like Maripol, Kharkiv, Shenihiv, and many others, bustling and full of life just one month ago, are encycled, bombarded, and blockaded. People in these towns lack food, water, medicine, electricity, and heating. They are trapped, desperate, afraid. In some neighborhoods, it's not even safe to bury the dead. More than 10 million people, including more than half of Ukraine's children, have fled their homes. This includes an, estimate, an estimated 6.5 million people who are internally displaced in the country, according to the International Organization for Migration. The UN Refugee Agency reports that more than 3.9 million refugees have crossed the borders to neighboring countries in the past month. Madam President, our work is to save lives. The humanitarian system has scaled up to deliver despite the spreading conflict. Since February 24th, humanitarian organizations have reached around 890,000 people across Ukraine, mostly in the East with multi-sectoral assistance. People have received food, shelter, blankets, medicine, bottled water and hygiene supplies. We are working around the clock to reach more and more people in need. The UN and our humanitarian partners are working impartially and relentlessly to uphold humanitarian principles, negotiate safe passage in and out of encycled areas for one cause alone, to provide life-saving assistance. Humanitarian logistics and supply chains are scaling up every day, but treacherous security risks and access challenges are hampering our efforts. Many routes are disrupted and humanitarian convoys and workers are frequently unable to pass due to shelling, fighting, and landmines. Humanitarians of all stripes are putting their lives at risk to help those in need. There are now more than 1,230 United Nations personnel in the country working via humanitarian hubs 
across the country. And there are more than 100 humanitarian organizations implementing or planning activities in every oblast in Ukraine, in all sectors. The brave work of the Ukrainian Red Cross and other civil society organizations who are working shoulder to shoulder with volunteers and communities is astounding. Ukraine is a humanitarian paradox. Side by side with extreme violence, we see extreme kindness, profound solidarity, and the gentlest of care. I am humbled and inspired by the tireless commitment of these people, and we must continue to support their work. Where security allows, humanitarian convoys are unloading much needed supplies and delivering equipment to repair damaged infrastructure. On 18th of March, after delays due to ongoing hostilities, the first UN-organized convoy reached Sumi in the Northeast. The convoy delivered 130 tons of much needed medical supplies, water, ready to eat meals, and canned food for 35,000 people, as well as essential equipment for the repair of water systems that will help improve access to water for some 50,000 people. Yesterday, again after delays due to ongoing fighting, the second UN organized convoy reached Kharkiv, where supplies of food, other essential relief items, and emergency health kits and medicines were unloaded for distribution by the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. Countrywide, more than 180 metric tons of medical supplies have been delivered, and more than 470 metric tons are on the way. Where we can, we buy supplies from the local market and work alongside local efforts. But we need to move to scale. More convoys are planned for the days and weeks ahead to reach many more people with desperately needed aid. I'm sure David will tell us more about the World Food Program and its work over the past month and expansion of its operations in Ukraine. Madam President, civilians in Ukraine desperately need this assistance and protection. But to do that, all parties must uphold their obligations under international humanitarian law to ensure safe and unhindered humanitarian access to help civilians in their homes and those on the road in Ukraine and to allow those civilians who want to leave to get out. We need detailed, realistic agreements on humanitarian ceasefires and pauses to allow aid in and people out. For predators and human traffickers, the war in Ukraine is not a tragedy. It is an opportunity. Humanitarian organizations are worried about the risk of trafficking, as well as sexual violence, exploitation, and abuse in Ukraine and the region. Children fleeing the war are at especially heightened risk of human trafficking and exploitation. Predators are luring single parents on the road with promises of transport and accommodation. We are scaling up our protection services at the borders, but also in the country to make sure people have information available on safe options and routes, access to helplines and safe shelters. Humanitarian partners are coordinating closely to not only monitor risks of sexual violence, trafficking and abuse, but provide swift and specialized services to survivors. Madam President, humanitarian partners agree our worst case scenario has been reached and in some areas surpassed. This is why last week the principles of the Interagency Standing Committee agreed to revise the flash appeal 
that has rallied nearly 506 million of the 1.1 billion needed to support the response. The Refugee Response Plan, coordinated by the UN's Refugee Agency, UNHCR, will also be revised. The generosity and welcome of Ukraine's neighbors is, remains a bright spot in a darkening landscape. Madam President, the global impacts of this war are becoming clearer as each day of this conflict continues. It threatens to make things even worse in the world's biggest humanitarian crisis, such as Afghanistan, Yemen, and in the Horn of Africa. These countries are already grappling with food insecurity and economic fragility. Rises in food, fuel, and fertilizer prices will hit hard now and for the coming seasons. We are only beginning to see the breath of this crisis on other regions and countries. We will all be affected. Madam President, the Secretary General has asked Under Secretary General Martin Griffith to urgently engage with the parties on possible arrangements for a humanitarian ceasefire in Ukraine. Martin has already been in touch with both parties who have welcomed the initiative and he will travel to the region within days. We must find measures from local pauses to wider ceasefires to save lives, protect the homes of civilians from being attacked, their schools, their hospitals. Civilians are running out of food, of energy, and of hope. Our aim is simple, silence the guns and save lives. Thank you very much. I thank Ms. Monsieur for her briefing, and I now give the floor to Mr. David Beasley. Madam President, thank you very much, and it's good to hear from Joyce, and I'll try not to repeat much of what Joyce said, but uh, it's just hard to believe that before the Ukraine crisis, that things could get any worse around the world. We were already, because of fuel prices, food pricing, shipping costs, beginning to cut rations for millions of children and families around the world in countries like, let's say, Yemen, where we had just cut 8 million people down to 50% rations, and now we're looking to go to zero rations. Niger, Mali, Chad, and I could go on and on and on. So now we're talking about a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe. Because Ukraine, from the breadbasket of the world now to bread lines, we never would have dreamed anything like this would be possible. And it's not just decimating dynamically Ukraine in the region, but it will have global context impact beyond anything we've seen since World War II. So let me touch upon a couple of things inside Ukraine. We've reached uh, right now about a million people. Over the next four weeks, we will reach two and a half million people. And by the end of May, we will have reached 4 million people. And then by the end of June, we hope to be reaching about 6 million people uh, on any given day, week, or month, so to speak. The price tag that we're looking at just on the food security side inside uh, Ukraine is about $500 million for the first three months. We've we short about $300 million, so we're going to need to step up. Now, one of the things we got to be careful while we are concerned about Ukraine, we can't neglect the Sahel, Northern Africa, the rest of Africa, the Middle East. Otherwise, you'll have massive migration coming from all sides of Europe. And so this is a crisis on top of a crisis. And so we all know the extraordinary, loving, welcoming arms of strangers and neighbors in Poland and Romania and Hungary, Slovakia, and Moldova have been remarkable as I've been there now three times just in the past few weeks watching firsthand the experience of people. But that's the people that have made it to the outside, the three and a half to four million people. And one way you can say they're the lucky ones because they are getting food, they're getting shelter, they're getting help, they're getting some degree of hope out of harm's way. But you have 40 million people, 40 million that are inside Ukraine. And we've got to do everything we can to stabilize the food supply chain system and reach as many people as we possibly can. Because you can imagine the farmers 
are on the front lines fighting. And it's planting season for corn maize right now for the next four weeks. Well, who's going to be tending the crops? Then you got harvest season for, let's say, wheat coming up in June, July. Well, if the farmers are on the front lines, you can see we're concerned not just about what happens inside Ukraine, but also what's going to be happening outside Ukraine. Obviously, we're appealing to everyone involved to deconflict, give us the access we need. Most of the places around in Ukraine, we can reach in a lot of different ways right now, but places like Maripol, we can't. And we need the access uh, that Joyce was talking about so that we can reach the people that are in harm's way and don't have access uh, to food. We will be using cash-based transfers as well as commodities, uh, in-kind food itself, depending upon each dynamic of every particular area. As you can imagine, Ukraine is not a small country. And so we're pre-positioning moving food, working with the government to move it by train, by truck, whatever it takes. And we're working with the government to make certain that we have the truck drivers we need to do what's necessary to reach the people in need. So let me just kind of capitalize Ukraine and now shoot to the outside because as you have heard, Ukraine and Russia produce 30% of the global supply for wheat, 20% of the global supply of maize, corn, 80, 75 to 80% of sunflower seed oil. So you can begin to see the dynamic consequences. 50% of the grain that we buy comes from Ukraine. We feed 125 million people before Ukraine ever happened. And so you can only assumed the devastation that this is going to have on our operations alone. Already, we are anticipating a $71 million increase in monthly expenses because of fuel costs, food costs, and shipping costs. That's $850 million, which means that's $4 million less people will be able to reach just from expense costs alone. Then you take countries like Yemen, the devastation and the dependence on Russian Ukrainian wheat. Ethi uh, Egypt, 85% dependent upon Ukraine grain. Uh, Lebanon in, in 2020, 85%, 81% dependent upon uh, grain from Ukraine. And I can keep going around the world as you can only imagine. And then you compound that with the lack of fertilizer based products that come out of Belarus and Russia. And, you know, if you don't put fertilizers on the crops, your yield will be at least 50 percent uh, diminished. So we're looking at what could be a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe in the months ahead. This is why when I was talking to the G7 ministers, secretaries of agriculture, how quickly can the world agricultural community offset the reduction that we could expect out of Ukraine and Russia in terms of supply demand. What at one time we were very concerned and mostly concerned about pricing. I think we're now looking at it's a pricing problem and maybe an availability problem if we can't have the offsets for what we'll lose inside Ukraine and uh, Russia. So these are very, very serious issues. As we're talking to leaders around the world, how to respond quickly to do the things necessary to minimize the impact globally as well as in the Ukraine itself. If you go back and look at Arab Spring 2008 and 2011 and 12 economic indices, food pricing that were spiking, you'll begin to see there's a lot of similarities, except quite frankly, it's much worse in some categories than it was in 2008, 2011, 12, because now we have the Ethiopian war, Afghanistan, uh, more climate crises that are impacting the Sahel, for example. So these are going to be difficult, difficult months ahead. ahead. Many of you nation states have been stepping up in ways you've not done before. But let me tell you, if we don't step up and don't respond, we'll pay a price that'll be a thousand times more expensive than stepping in and doing what's necessary as we saw, for example, in Syria, where we can feed a Syrian, for example, 50 cents a day. That same Syrian ends up in Berlin or Brussels. It's $70 or more per day. And so if we act in the conflict, address the needs, we can avoid famine, destabilization of nations, and mass migration. But if we don't, the world is going to pay a mighty price. And the last thing we want to be doing 
at the World Food Program is taking food from hungry children to give to starving children. Please, let's make certain that we can reach them all. So, Madam President, thank you. Thank you very much. I thank Mr. Beasley for his briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of France. Madame la Présidente. Madam President, I would like to thank Mr. Amir Abdullah and Madam Joyce Masura for their statements, and I would especially like to express gratitude for the extraordinary organization of OCHA, the WFP, and all the humanitarian agencies who can count on our support. The humanitarian situation in Ukraine is getting worse day by day. All indicators are in the red. Last week, the General Assembly demanded, with a crushing majority, the immediate cessation of hostilities of Russia against Ukraine with full respect of international humanitarian law. This resolution proposed by France and Mexico should make it possible to support the Secretary General's efforts as well as humanitarian actors who are on the ground in order to support civilian populations and bring them absolutely vital assistance. But the Council also needs to continue to fully assume its responsibilities, given the humanitarian drama which is unfolding before our eyes. It is imperative that Russia respect the Geneva Conventions, civilians, including children, persons with disabilities and medical and humanitarian personnel, as well as civilian infrastructures, must be protected. Full humanitarian access should be guaranteed. And those civilians who so wish in Mariupol and in all cities under attack should be able to leave combat areas safely le siège and freely. De doit être the levé. siege of Mariupol must Madame be lifted. La Madam President, la de la Russia's aggression against Ukraine is increasing the, the risk of famine around the world. The populations of developing poussée. countries are the first to be affected. La Russie Russia essaiera certainement will no de doubt faire try to make us believe that it is the sanctions adopted against it that are creating an imbalance mondial. in the world Soyons security clair. situation for food. Let's be clear here. Russia alone is solely responsible. It is the unjustified and unjustifiable war that it unleashed that is preventing Ukraine from exporting its grain, which is disrupting world foods food supply chains and which is leading to an increase in prices, which then is jeopardizing access to foodstuffs for the most vulnerable people. It is the pursuit of the fighting which threatens agricultural activity in Ukraine and harvest to come. The European Union and its partners have adopted sanctions so that Russia would fall in line with the United Nations Charter. These sanctions do not target agricultural activity in Russia. Given the world food disorder, the most effective response is immediate cessation of the Russian aggression. It's also important to strengthen international cooperation in this area, and France fully supports the initiative launched by the Secretary General through the United Nations Group to respond to the world crisis. France in its capacity as president of the European Union, has launched an initiative called FARM, Food and Agricultural Resilience Mission. This initiative is geared to lowering tensions on world food markets and ensuring free movement of foodstuffs. It is, should also make it possible to provide rapid access for agricultural products for those countries where demand is the most urgent and to ensure rural development and agro-food agro production in Africa. We call upon the relevant private and public actors to join this initiative, which should also be included in the efforts of the United Nations Secretary General in this regard. Madam President, it is urgent that we act. France commends the courage shown by the people of Ukraine in the United Nations and in all 
avec ses partenaires Meetings, pour France will continue to mobilize with all of its partners to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. France will spare no effort so that full light is shed on these criminal allegations which once established should not go unpunished. Thank you. Representative of France for their statement, I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, President. Agradezco las I would like to thank de la señora Joyce Madam Joyce Masuya, sec Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Benny Affairs, Benny and Mr. Amir Abdullah, Deputy Executive Director of the World Food Program, for their briefings. And I would like to welcome the Ambassador of Ukraine to this Cada session. Semana, Every week, there is an exponential increase in the humanitarian drama in Ukraine, and the figures that we just heard reflect the deterioration of the situation. I just mention them because we must not lose sight of the proportion and dimension of this affair. Twelve million people are impacted. 3.8 million refugees and 6.5 million internally displaced persons in just five weeks. Particularly alarming is the fact that 90% of the refugees are women and children. We need to underscore right from the start and very clearly that the risks that they run are of being victims of trafficking, exploitation, sexual or gender-based violence. And it is due to the continual unraveling of the situation on the ground that Mexico and France requested today's briefing. Five weeks after the beginning of Russia's invasion, the international community's priority is a cessation of hostilities and protection of the civilian population of Ukraine. Evidence of that is the overwhelming majority with which Resolution ES-11-2 of the Special Session of the General Assembly of the 24th of March. Madam President, the war has also had significant consequences in terms of food supplies and food security at a world level, as we just heard. The effects are very serious, both in the immediate term and in the medium and long runs. During the negotiations of the aforementioned General Assembly resolution, many delegations mentioned this issue and indicated that it was a priority. The Secretary General has also been quite explicit in this regard. We acknowledge and recognize the intention of the World Food Program to support basic needs for some 3 million people who are impacted by this conflict. And it should also be recognized that some 1 million people in Ukraine have benefited already from transfers of funds and distribution of food. But these are clearly temporary relief, although very timely because they are also very necessary. But they're temporary. We know that there are many logistical difficulties in order to bring humanitarian assistance to where it is most needed. There are limits on fuel, transportation, drivers, and now with the closing of the major ports and insecurity with commercial vessels, it is more difficult. In some cities, such as the case of Mariupol, the situation has become acute, and this is why we insist on our call for a guarantee of secure access without impediment to humanitarian personnel. The conflict has already had a direct negative impact on global food markets and energy markets, raising the prices of these products. This increase of prices is starting to be felt in national markets, and in various regions there will ultimately be a limit to the access of people, at least, to some kinds of food. As a result, therefore, there will also be an increase in the cost of operation for the World Food Program, which we've just heard, and that will then in turn limit its capacity of response to meet the growing needs and the new food insecurity which will be created in different regions beyond Ukraine. We would highlight here the efforts of humanitarian agencies of the United Nations and who have provided support to millions of people, both in Ukraine and in neighboring countries, who have provided refuge 
to the Ukrainians, and we would like to commend their generosity. Madam President, La resolution, resolution ES-11-2 ES stroke of the General Assembly is also aimed at this, ensuring that the existing the conditions exist on the ground for the humanitarian personnel to have safe and unrestricted access and are able to do their jobs. Also, we have followed with concern the increase in the flow of weapons towards Ukraine. The proliferation of weapons could end up leading to greater violence amongst the civilian population. And if these weapons fall in the wrong hands, it could also give way to other violations of international law and human rights. It's necessary to evaluate to what extent these weapons may ultimately end up exacerbating the humanitarian situation in the country. Clearly, we deplore the use of explosive weapons and cluster munitions in urban zones and, and should be put to this kind of weapon usage. Madam President, finally, Mexico's priorities vis-a-vis -vis this conflict have been and will continue to be the protection of civilians, humanitarian aid, and respect of international law, including international humanitarian law and the rights of refugees. It is urgent to have an immediate cessation of hostilities, and if that is achieved, it's necessary in the meantime to have pauses, sustainable humanitarian pauses to guarantee protection of civilians and access to humanitarian aid. We once again reiterate that humanitarian assistance cannot be subject to political considerations. We would therefore call for the full implementation of the aforementioned resolution that was adopted a few days ago by the General Assembly. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the representative of Mexico for their statement. I give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Wendy Sherman, Deputy Secretary of State of the United States of America. Thank you, Madam President, uh, for welcoming me to represent the United States at the Security Council today. And thank you, Assistant Secretary Masua and Executive Director Breesley, and welcome Deputy Executive uh, of the WFP, Abdullah, for your briefings today. <clears throat> and of course, I welcome the Ambassador from Ukraine. It has been five weeks five weeks, though it feels like a lifetime, since Russian President Vladimir Putin launched his premeditated, unprovoked, unjustified, and brutal invasion of Ukraine. In just five weeks, nearly a quarter of Ukraine's population has been displaced, including more than half of the nation's children. In just five weeks, Nearly four million Ukrainians have fled their country as refugees. Now the World Food Program warns that 45% of the people in Ukraine, nearly half of the people of Ukraine living in one of the world's greatest breadbaskets, are concerned about having enough to eat. Russia's ceaseless bombardment of Ukraine's cities and critical infrastructure has created one of the fastest growing humanitarian crises in recent decades. Russian forces have laid siege to cities like Mariupol, where citizens have been left without food, water, heat, or electricity in the depths of winter. People have resorted to melting snow for drinking water. One mother told reporters she could feed her three daughters only a spoonful of honey a day as they hid from Russian bombs. Now city officials say people are beginning to die, to die of starvation. Think about that. Five weeks ago, Mariupol was at peace. It was in fact a bustling port city, a grain exporter that helped feed the world. Today, its residents are dying because of President Putin's war of choice. The impacts of Putin's war are being felt far beyond Ukraine's borders as well, with some of the most immediate and dangerous implications for global food security. As has been said, 
Ukraine and Russia are both major agricultural producers. 30% of the world's wheat exports typically come from the Black Sea region, as does 20% of the world's corn and 75% of sunflower oil. But Russia has bombed at least three civilian ships carrying goods from Black Sea ports to the rest of the world, including one chartered by an agribusiness company. The Russian Navy is blocking access to Ukraine's ports, essentially cutting off exports of grain. They are reportedly preventing approximately 94 ships carrying food for the world market from reaching the Mediterranean. It's no wonder many shippers are now hesitant to send vessels into the Black Sea, even to Russian ports, given the danger posed by Russian forces. Russian missiles and bombs have damaged and destroyed Ukrainian airports, rail lines, train stations, and highways that are critical for getting humanitarian aid to those who need it and for exporting wheat, corn, and other commodities. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kaleba has told his counterparts that Russia is actively targeting grain silos and food storage facilities. All of these actions by Russia are creating a food crisis in Ukraine and well beyond Ukraine's borders. Already, food prices are skyrocketing and low and in middle-income countries as, Russian choke, as Russia chokes off Ukrainian exports. Across the Middle East and Africa, already high prices for staple commodities, including wheat, have risen between 20 and 50 percent so far this year. We are particularly concerned about countries like Lebanon, Pakistan, Libya, Tunisia, Yemen, and Morocco, which rely heavily on Ukrainian imports to feed their populations. The world, as we have heard, was already facing a food security crisis well before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic crisis pushed millions of families into poverty. Countries around the world are grappling with drought and other disasters made worse by climate change. As we heard from Executive Director Beasley, the World Food Pro Program is already feeding 138 million people in more than 80 countries, from Ethiopia to Afghanistan, South Sudan to Yemen, Nigeria to Syria. But now, Putin's war is driving up the cost of providing food assistance, and the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, estimates that as many as 13 million more people worldwide may be pushed into food insecurity as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Many of you have heard the Russian government blame U.S. allied and partner sanctions for increasing food costs around the world. But the facts, the facts, colleagues, are clear. Sanctions aren't preventing grain from leaving Ukraine's ports. Putin's war is. And Russia's own food and agricultural exports are not under sanction by the U.S. or by our allies and partners. The responsibility for waging war on Ukraine and for the war's effects on global food security falls solely on President Putin. The international community must come together to meet this moment, to provide food, water, shelter, and medicine for the Ukrainian people, to support Ukraine's neighbors who have taken in millions of refugees, and to bolster global food security, and protect the world's most vulnerable from hunger as a result of Putin's war. The United States is committed to doing our part to ease the human suffering caused by this war in Ukraine and elsewhere around the world. Last week, President Biden announced that the United States is prepared to provide more than $1 billion in new humanitarian assistance for the Ukrainian people, those fleeing to neighboring countries and those around the world feeling the effects of Putin's war, including rising food insecurity. The United States has also committed to provide more than $11 billion over the next five years to address food security and nutrition needs around the world, including in countries where food prices are rising as a result of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. But the fact remains that so long as Putin continues his war, so long as Russian forces continue to bombard Ukrainian cities and block aid convoys. So long as besieged civilians are unable to get to safety, this 
humanitarian crisis will only get worse in Ukraine, for the Russian people, and around the world. Russia must abide by its obligations under international humanitarian law on the protection of civilians, including those who are fleeing conflict and those who are providing humanitarian assistance. We hope, we really hope, that President Putin will commit seriously to the peace talks underway. But we are focused on what Russian forces do, not what Russia says, not what Putin says. And ultimately, the only way to end this humanitarian catastrophe is through adorable ceasefire and the complete withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukrainian territory and away from Ukraine's borders. That decision, like the decision to begin this unprovoked, unjustified war in the first place, lies with one man and one man only. Vladimir Putin started this war. He created this global food crisis. And he is the one who can stop it. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Her Excellency Ms. Sherman for her statement. I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Kenya. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I thank ASG Joyce Musuya and WFP uh, Director David Beasley for their briefings. I also welcome the participation of the distinguished representative of Ukraine. Madam President, the war in Ukraine is a humanitarian catastrophe. More than 10 million people have fled their homes. Three million have left the country as refugees. The speed with which the situation has deteriorated, the immense damage to civilian infrastructure, the shockingly high number of civilian and military fatalities on both sides. We are reminded of the carnage that we have only read in the history books, and therefore we fear that it could get far worse. We offer our heartfelt condolences to the families who are grieving for their relatives killed in the violence. We offer our condolences as well to the government of Ukraine that must now try and provide aid to the people even as it resists a breaching of its territorial integrity by the Russian Federation. We commend Ukraine's neighbors for opening their borders to receive refugees of multiple nationalities. We urge them to ensure that the protection sought are offered with no discrimination on any basis, particularly regarding race or religion. Madam President, it is not only Ukrainians who have fled from the bombings. Thousands of Africans who travel long distances to seek their education in Ukraine have also had to flee for their lives. These African students in Ukraine and other parts of the world travel to study as representatives of their families' hopes for betterment. Thousands made this hopeful journey to Ukraine. Now they are fleeing before the tanks and bomber planes sent into Ukraine. They have turned from hopeful students into fearful refugees. Statistics are impersonal. They flattered the human experience. But a humanitarian crisis is human-sized. It is a million individual lives shattered by fear and violence. Our delegation spoke to Corinne Sky, a Zimbabwean-born student doctor at Nipro Medical Institute. She had to flee for her safety, joined by her close friends, to make a dangerous 26-hour road trip to Lviv in Western Ukraine. It took almost four days to make the journey and cross the border to safety. At the border, she suffered the indignity and danger of racism. She encountered that racism as she fled the impersonal brutality of bombs. She then co-founded the Black Women for Black Lives to support thousands of African students fleeing Ukraine. They have raised funds, gotten word out, and assisted many who, like them, were fleeing from the conflict. I urge everyone listening to this briefing to visit their website
as blackwomenforblacklives.org for further information about this heroic effort. Today, Corrine is calling for the safety of civilians, particularly for the African students trapped in Kesson. Civilians, including foreign nationals in Ukraine, are not party to the conflict and must not be made a target. In this regard, all actors must prioritize the protection of civilians and objects indispensable to their survival in accordance with international law and international humanitarian law. Special and urgent attention should be paid to those trapped in besieged cities and villages, such as Mariupol and Kesson. We call for the urgent activation of safe passages with no restrictions. The response to Ukraine's humanitarian crisis has shown how boldly and generously the world can react in solidarity. We commend OCHA, the World Food Program, and the many other organizations and individuals who have come to the aid of the deserving people of Ukraine. We urge the European Union and its members to offer their every support to the African students who have fled Ukraine. It seems eminently doable that those who have been students in Ukrainian institutions should receive or can receive offers to further their education in other countries, as well as the mental health and material support that they need. We must also not forget our responsibilities in other humanitarian crises. Very frequently, the Security Council is briefed on the shortfalls in financing of humanitarian aid in Africa and the Middle East. The situation now is even worse given the surge in food and energy prices due to the war in Ukraine and its resulting sanctions. Madam President, development is being reversed worldwide as a result of the war. Livelihoods are being destroyed. Farmers needing affordable fertilizer are struggling to cope. Inflation is surging upward. The result of these domino-like effects will be stunted health for millions and an earlier than normal death for many others. A few weeks ago, we were urging building back better after COVID-19. Now we will need to add the war in Ukraine to that. We urge the Secretary General to rally the United Nations, the major economies, and international financial institutions to design instruments that can cushion the most vulnerable from the effects of the conflict in Ukraine. Lacking such action, the solidarity required will eventually suffer from the, from the rising inequalities and economic calamities. Madam President, in the final telling, the most humane action that can be undertaken is a cessation of hostilities. We call for that a cessation that has clearly defined contact lines and, a, and humanitarian corridors. The cessation of hostilities should set the foundations for a lasting peace settlement that respects the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of Ukraine. It should also lead to the design of a European security order that offers lasting security and not a generation of new wars in Europe. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much, Madam President, and I'd like to thank uh, Executive Director David Beasley, Amr Abdullah, and Assistant Secretary General Joyce Musa for updating this council on the humanitarian catastrophe that is engulfing the people of Ukraine. I also wanted to welcome our dear colleague from Ukraine amongst us this afternoon. The grim realities that have been shared with us in the last minutes uh, starkly demonstrate the human misery caused by this senseless and unlawful war. And the roll call of devastation caused by Russia's war goes on. Daily, we are witnessing the devastating humanitarian impacts of Russia's use of explosive weapons in populated areas. At least 1,100 civilian deaths have now been confirmed by the UN, including over 100 children. And we all know at this table that the real figure is likely to be far higher. Numbers speak for themselves. Over 3.9 million refugees have fled 
for their lives from Russia's invasion. 6.5 million people have been displaced within Ukraine's own borders, desperately sheltering from a war with diminishing resources and little to no access to basic needs. We are deeply concerned regarding the increasing vulnerabilities of IDPs and refugees as this war continues. Reported so-called deportations, or quite frankly abductions, where Ukrainian citizens are taken forcibly across the border and into Russia, are simply horrifying. We are also troubled by the activities of human traffickers, to whom this war offers optimal conditions to prey on fleeing women and children. I say it again, we condemn in the strongest terms acts of sexual and gender-based violence against women and violence against children, which have been reported by humanitarian organisations. This is particularly unconscionable and, frankly, ranks amongst the other horrors being faced by Ukrainian citizens. There can be no impunity for those responsible. We are being warned of an emerging child protection crisis as the numbers of unaccompanied and separated children rises. We have a responsibility to heed those warnings. We once again call on the Russian Federation to uphold their obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law, to allow full, safe and unhindered humanitarian access for humanitarian personnel in order for them to reach those in need. The Russian Federation must also allow all those seeking to leave Ukraine to do so safely to destinations of their own choosing. Truth is, only the Russian Federation can prevent further deterioration of the humanitarian situation it has caused. President, with the world facing a looming hunger crisis, we see now that the consequences of this senseless war are being felt far beyond Ukraine's sovereign borders. This unjustified war is already having a multiplier effect on food and nutrition insecurity, compounding other challenges, droughts, floods and conflict elsewhere that were already increasing prices and squeezing supply chains. The Russian Federation is one of the world's biggest grain producers and in waging an unprovoked war against another major producer is pushing up the price of staples, putting even a loaf of bread out of the reach of those living on the edge of survival. In addition, cruelly, Ukrainian farmers are now prevented by war from planting, harvesting and exporting grain. Future harvests are therefore already lost, with longer term consequences for global food security. As we've heard, this war has already greatly impacted the ability of the WFP itself to meet hunger needs, materially and financially, right around the world. President, we were warned that 2022 was set to be a year of catastrophic hunger. Now this senseless war has all but confirmed that ugly catastrophe. As if we needed reminding, this war brings the connection between conflict and hunger into stark relief. Lives are being lost due to the food insecurity caused by this war. And even if it were to end right now, this afternoon, it will still result in lives lost from hunger into the future. President, the war has raged for five long weeks, five weeks of destruction, bombardment, loss of life, loss of hope. What is not lost is our solidarity with the Ukrainian people. That remains steadfast and it remains resolute. The international community and this council must not be numbed to the ongoing tragedy in Ukraine. The truth remains as it has for the past five weeks that this war can end if the Russian Federation has the will to end it. People trapped in need of aid in besieged cities can be reached. Life-saving aid can be delivered through safe humanitarian access. Further flows of desperate, vulnerable refugees can be prevented. Countless lives can be saved, but only if the war ends. Only if hostilities cease and Russia ends its aggression, complies with obligations under international law, 
only if the Russian Federation withdraws all forces unconditionally from the entirety of the sovereign territory of Ukraine. We call again on the Russian Federation to do the right thing, to end this war, to remember diplomacy, to engage in genuine dialogue in good faith and to restore peace in Ukraine. I continue to believe it's never too late to do the right thing. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of Ireland for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam President. We thank today's briefers. Today we heard and will likely hear once again many calls for a humanitarian truce, providing humanitarian access, humanitarian pauses, and humanitarian corridors. Yesterday, such initiatives were advanced by Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Colleagues, it is hard not to marvel at your inconsistency. Just last Wednesday, less than a week ago, the majority of you rejected our draft humanitarian resolution in the Council, which would have been binding on all parties and which contained a specific list of steps to be undertaken to unblock the work of humanitarian agencies, primarily in the east of Ukraine. In connection with this, today's statements, particularly those from Western delegations, come across as quite hypocritical. And yet our proposals, which were contained in that draft, went much further than the list presented by our Western colleagues. It also contained demands not to place heavy weapons in residential areas, not to use civilians as a shield, and their adoption by the Council could have saved innumerable lives as as the main threat to civilians in Ukrainian towns and cities comes from Ukrainian Nazis and radicals that are using civilians as living shields. The internet is full of video evidence of this from liberated cities or from those who were able to leave through humanitarian corridors even as they were being shelled by Ukrainian armed forces and nationalists. I hope you've seen these images. And yet today we're being told that we're allegedly bombing vessels with grain as well as uh, grain storage warehouses. The text of the resolution also contained a demand for humane and respectful treatment of prisoners uh, in the context of Ukrainian Nazis putting videos online which show them severely mistreating Russian soldiers being held prisoner. And have you seen these images? And this is happening while Russia is strictly complying with its international obligations and there is no threat to Ukrainians who put down their arms. You can also find evidence of this in videos on social media. Ukrainian Nazis do not shy away from the most sophisticated forms of torture and reprisals. It is enough to mention the shocking discovery of civilians tortured to death in Nazi uh, battalion torture prisons with swastikas branded on their mutilated bodies. And I, have you seen those images? In the context of such a cruel treatment of, by Ukrainian radicals and special services of their own citizens. We have serious concerns regarding the measures being taken by Kiev to physically eliminate undesirable public opinion leaders. In our letter from March 21st, we officially informed the Council about the abduction by the security services of Ukraine of civil activist Yelena Berezhnaya, who took part in Council meetings. There is still no information on her fate. Since then, similar reports have been received regarding Vasily Volga, a Ukrainian opposition politician, a leader of the Union of Left Forces Party, political scientist Dmitry Jangirov, opposition political scientist Yuri Dudkin, journalist and publicist 
Dmitry Skortsov, historian and public figure Alexander Karevin, publicist and TV host Jan Taksur, and editor-in-chief of the Odessa publication Timer, Yuri Tkachov. The Ukrainian security forces also carried out a search at the home of another political science scientist who is known to the council, Mikhail Pogorbinsky. We have no information regarding what is happening to him today, and we await fair assessments of this kind of witch hunt from our Western colleagues and specialized UN and OSC human rights bodies. The list of problems created by Kiev keeps growing. Added danger in the form of drifting Ukrainian mine has now appeared at sea. Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkey have already encountered or will soon encounter this dangerous problem. In this context, we would like to emphasize that the Russian armed forces are posing no threat to the freedom of civilian navigation. In order to allow foreign vessels to leave Ukrainian ports for open sea, we have set up a humanitarian corridor which is 80 nautical miles long with a three-mile traffic lane. The corridor is operational daily from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Moscow time. This information has been communicated by us to all interested parties. Madam President, although our Western colleagues did not support the aforementioned draft humanitarian resolution in the Council, we are one-sidedly implementing all the humanitarian obligations we have taken upon ourselves. We organize humanitarian corridors daily. Thus, today we once again provided 10 routes both towards Russia as well as to the west of Ukraine. We're organizing deliveries of essential goods, medicines, and food to those in need. We have already delivered over 6,000 tons of aid to Ukraine, and half a million refugees uh, from Ukraine are currently being hosted in Russia. Communication channels have been established and are successfully functioning between the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia with the leadership of the ICRC and OCHA. In direct coordination with ICRC, we are organizing safe corridors for the evacuation and for searching and exchanging prisoners. On March 18th, with the assistance of Russian armed forces, the first UN humanitarian convoy traveled from Poltava to Sumy. 130 tons of humanitarian aid were delivered and disseminated. And while convoys with tons of food and essential goods are traveling to Ukraine, what's traveling from the west to Ukraine, as we all know, is weapons and missiles. Madam President, today we heard and will again hear a claim about the allegedly imminent global food crisis. As Western delegations presented, it is caused exclusively by Russia's actions in Ukraine. In putting the questions this way, our Western colleagues are being disingenuous. The real reasons why the global food market is facing serious turbulence are by no means in the actions of Russia, rather in the unbridled sanctions hysteria that the West has unleashed against Russia, without considering the population of the so-called global south, nor of its own citizens. Attempts to isolate Russia economically, financially, and logistically from established years-long channels of cooperation are already turning into an economic crisis of historic proportions. It is clear even to the average observer that lifting tensions in logistical and financial relations, ensuring uninterrupted shipments, and stabilizing international agricultural and food markets is possible only by rejecting unlawful unilateral restrictions. After all, the stocks of food produced in Russia haven't decreased. It is Western states themselves who are capable of preventing hunger and food shortages, no, much, no matter how much they may try to claim the opposite today in trying to shift the blame to Russia. Madam President, we also cannot fail to express our concern over ongoing cases of vehicles with UN insignia being confiscated by Ukrainian armed forces. It is good that the Secretary has finally acknowledged 
such offenses uh, taking place in Kharkiv and Mariupol. We are awaiting a response to our most recent inquiry regarding a UN vehicle with diplomatic plates DP-210015, also in Kharkiv, which, according to witness testimony, took part in combat operations of Ukrainian nationalists. We're aware of cases radical using OSC vehicles as well, and our colleagues in Vienna are in full possession of this information. It is important for both international organizations to provide fair assessments to such, of such incidents. By the way, publications online clearly show that DHL delivery vehicles have also fallen into the hands of the Ukrainian army and are being used to transport weapons. We cannot rule out that the vehicles of these organizations organizations or vehicles with medical markings are being used to transport the very weapons that the West so generously promised to Kyiv from neighboring states into Ukraine. And I hope you understand what reputational damage such a scenario could deal to all international entities concealing the fact of such vehicles with their insignia being used for such purposes. Madam President, in conclusion, I would like to respond to a talking point that has already become common in the vocabulary of our Western colleagues, namely that Russia's military and military operation is allegedly an unprovoked, senseless war of choice. This is also a formula that we heard again today. We have repeatedly explained what has led to the current crisis, and those who accuse us of this are doing that inter alia because they seek to gloss over their role in provoking this crisis, and they are are pretending that they and their policies towards Russia and creating a state, an anti-Russian state for geopolitical purposes, which is uh, something that Ukraine has turned into, that this has nothing to do with them. If we are going to talk about wars of choice, then let's recall the U.S. aggression against Yugoslavia, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Syria, and the Vietnam War. All of these states are thousands of kilometers away from Washington, and military warfare there led to nothing except hundreds of thousands of ruined and broken lives, leaving behind completely devastated countries and condemning millions of people to destitution and a miserable existence. These were wars of choice because the United States had a choice not to start those wars. Just as today, Washington and its allies has a choice to stop putting out the fire of the Ukrainian crisis with fuel by supplying the key of regime with weapons, as well as provoking an international food crisis and hunger in a number of states around the world. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Norway. Thank you, President. We thank the briefers for their sobering accounts of the situation on the ground. Russia's war against Ukraine represents a blatant violation of international law and the very principles of the UN Charter. Russia's war is causing the largest humanitarian crisis in Europe since the Second World War. The damage and destruction to civilian infrastructure, including food system, is devastating, as we have heard so clearly from the briefers today. The attacks on civilians are simply unacceptable. A quarter of the Ukrainian population has now been displaced. Once again, we reiterate that international humanitarian law must be respected, and the civilian population in Ukraine must be protected. A humanitarian ceasefire in Ukraine is urgently needed, and we welcome the Secretary General's initiative to request USG Griffiths to work directly with the parties on a possible agreement. We welcome also their renewed dialogue today between the parties and hope this will establish the trust needed for an early agreement on the cessation of hostilities. President, let me highlight just three areas of concern. First, the war is increasing the risk of sexual and gender-based violence, including sexual violence being used as a tactic of warfare. This is a great concern. Prevention, protection, and response must be scaled up. Second, immediate action must be taken to shield children in Ukraine from the harms of conflict, including suffering 
from a lack of both urgent and ongoing medical care. Many children have fled and are unaccompanied. They are extremely vulnerable and must be protected. And third, the massive displacement and refugee flows have led to reports of significant increase in human trafficking. This needs to be urgently addressed by all, including the UN and receiving states. President, Ukrainians are responding with great courage and commitment, and we recognize the leading role women are playing in the response. The work undertaken by international humanitarian organizations and their local partners and responders is crucial. Systematic engagement between them, together with affected people, needs to be strengthened. As the needs grow, their efforts and ability to stay and deliver must be accelerated. Humanitarian organizations must be allowed safe, rapid and unimpeded humanitarian access to people in need. We commend also the hospitality and solidarity extended by Ukraine's neighbors, and we encourage countries to keep their borders open to all those seeking protection without discrimination. President, the Secretary General, UNDP and other development organizations are sounding the alarm about regional and even global consequences of the war. This is both a humanitarian and development crisis. It is both a Ukrainian and a global crisis. Ukraine itself has been set back decades in its economic development. More than 60% of its citizens could fall below the poverty line within the next 12 months. The conflict will have a serious negative effect on the agricultural sector, likely leading to a global rise in food insecurity and increased prices of fuel and fertilizer, all contributing to social unrest and instability across the world. The ripple effects of the Russian aggression will be particularly felt by those living in conflict and crisis affected countries like Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Ethiopia and South Sudan. We therefore welcome the Secretary General's initiative to establish a global crisis response group on food, energy and finance. President, Russia's aggression has long-term consequences for Ukraine. It exacerbates other humanitarian crises and it undermines global economic development, peace and security. Russia must stop this unjust war. This is the only way to end the humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine and beyond. Thank you. I thank the representative of Norway for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Madam President. Let me begin by thanking Assistant Secretary General Joyce Misuya and the World Food Program Executive Director David Beasley for their briefings on the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. India remains deeply concerned at the ongoing situation, which continues to deteriorate since the beginning of the hostilities. We reiterate our call for unimpeded humanitarian access to areas of armed conflict in Ukraine. There is an urgent need to address the humanitarian needs of the affected population. In this regard, the initiatives of the UN and its agencies like OCHA and WFP have reinforced ongoing efforts. We also note the decision by the EU countries who have agreed to a permit free transit of humanitarian carriers to Ukraine. We hope the international community will continue to respond positively to the humanitarian needs of the people of Ukraine, including through extending generous support to the Secretary General's flash appeal and the Regional Refugee Response Plan on Ukraine. Keeping in view the dire humanitarian situation unfolding in Ukraine, India has already sent over 90 tons of humanitarian supplies to Ukraine and its neighbors. These supplies have included medicines and other essential relief material for refugees. We are providing more humanitarian assistance in the coming days, especially through supply of essential medicines. Allow me to underscore that it is important that humanitarian action is always guided by the principles of humanitarian assistance, which is humanity, neutrality, impartiality and independence, embedded as they are at the heart of UN guiding principles of humanitarian assistance. 
these measures should not be politicized. The conflict is already having an impact on the global economy, especially on many developing countries, including through disruption of supply chains. Its adverse impact on energy and commodity prices is evident. We reiterate our call for immediate cessation of hostilities across Ukraine. Our Prime Minister on several occasions has reiterated this and emphasized that there is no other option but the path of dialogue and diplomacy. We continue to emphasize that the global order is anchored in international law, the UN Charter and respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states. We call for purposeful engagement by both sides in the ongoing talks. We hope that an understanding could be reached soon. It is clearly in our collective interest to find a solution that can provide for immediate de-escalation of tensions amid aimed at securing long-term peace and stability in the region and beyond. I thank you. I thank the representative of India for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to begin by thanking the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator Joyce Musia and the Executive Director of the World Food Programme, David Brisley, for their briefings. I also welcome the participation in this meeting of the representative of Ukraine. Madam President, almost a week after the General Assembly voted in a landmark resolution with an unequivocal call for the immediate cessation of hostilities and the return to the path of dialogue and diplomacy, the signs on the ground are yet to reflect the sentiments of the international community for an early improvement in the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. The call for an unconditional and immediate ceasefire and for the withdrawal of all the invading troops from the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine are critical to save lives and prevent further devastation to the Ukrainian people. It remains fundamental to addressing the worsening humanitarian conditions. Ghana remains deeply concerned about the continuing military bombardment of cities and civilian populated areas of Ukraine and is disheartened by the trauma that the situation has caused, especially to the aged women and children. We note with regret the loss of lives, the displacement of people, and the overall suffering of the Ukrainian people from this needless war. Never has it been necessary than now for the parties to the conflict to urgently commit to a humanitarian pause to enable the evacuation and safe passage of civilians and facilitate the delivery of food, medicine, and other essential services to those in critical need who have been caught up in cities under siege. We also deplore the attacks on medical facilities and call for the protection of humanitarian workers and medical personnel. We urge the parties to comply with their commitments under international law and international humanitarian law, in particular the provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949 relative to the protection of civilian persons in the time of war. Ghana also encourages neighboring countries of Ukraine to facilitate the free passage of persons fleeing the war without discrimination and provide them with humanitarian assistance including medical care in line with the principles of humanity, neutrality, and impartiality. Madam President, we continue to remain concerned by the transmission of the shocks of the war in Ukraine within the global economy and the disproportionate impacts that developing countries and small economies are having to bear on account of this war, many of whom are already caught in the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. We reiterate our call for urgent international solidarity on the issues of sovereign release of SX food stocks, calibrated intervention in the oil market, and new debt initiatives and financial access mechanisms to help maintain global cohesion and stability at this precarious time. We note the reported intention of the Russian Federation to redeploy its forces from certain parts of Ukraine and urge her to follow through in the ongoing dialogue in Turkey aimed at a pathway to resolving the crisis. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ghana for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Madam President.
and I join others in thanking ASG Masuya and Executive Director David Beasley for their briefings. So we've heard once again today the appalling impact on the Ukrainian people of President Putin's senseless war of choice. 10.3 million people are displaced. 73 confirmed attacks on hospitals and medical centres. 659 schools and kindergartens damaged. The devastation in Mariupol is almost beyond description. Civilians remain without food, water, electricity. People are reportedly resorting to drinking not just snow, but sewage water to survive. There are credible reports of mass graves, forced deportations of residents to the Russian Federation, as well as incidents of sexual violence and use of landmines. There will be accountability for these crimes. So there is an urgent need to alleviate humanitarian suffering in Ukraine. We note the Secretary General's announcement yesterday about Martin Griffith's role in pursuing a humanitarian ceasefire. And we're grateful for the latest data from OCHA, the World Food Programme, and in the Secretary General's statement yesterday about those they've been able to reach. We encourage all efforts to help the people of Ukraine in agreement with the Ukrainian government. The UK will continue to play its part. We have provided 400 million pounds to support Ukraine, including 220 million pounds in humanitarian aid. And we call for close cooperation between the UN agencies and other donors to ensure this assistant reaches and protects the most vulnerable. But let us be without a shred of doubt, as the Secretary General set out yesterday, the only way to end the suffering is for Russia to end the war. Global commodity prices were already on the rise before the invasion, as economies recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic. We now see spiraling energy prices and global food insecurity, hitting the most vulnerable the hardest. Almost every UN member state is now suffering because of Russia's war. As David Beasley said, we now risk famine destabilization, and we risk having to take food from hungry children for starving children. Russia's appetite for war is taking food off the world's table. Madam President, the UK welcomes the General Assembly resolution adopted last week. UN member states sent an overwhelming message that Russia alone is to blame for the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine and for the shocks being felt globally. For the suffering to end, Russian bullets and bombs must stop and Russian tanks and troops must go home. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Madam President. Whoever seeks the truth about Ukraine today comes to the same conclusion. Russian aggression has caused a catastrophic humanitarian situation in Ukraine. It must end and give negotiations not just a chance, but the real place with an immediate nation nationwide ceasefire as 140 UN member states asked for just last week. Unfortunately, as we speak, people are still being killed. Dear colleagues, at the end of World War II, some 40 million people had been displaced from their homes. In Ukraine, only after five weeks, a quarter of the country's population of 44 million have been displaced by the Russian aggression. 
We were told repeatedly that this war does not concern civilians, but actually it has become mainly a war between the Russian army and Ukrainian civilians, be civilian people, including women and children. Mariupol, savagely battered into rubble and reduced to ashes, symbolizes the extreme brutality of the Russian inv invasion. In the words of the mayor of the city, Russian aim is to wipe the city off the face of the earth along with its inhabitants. There is a legal definition for this despicable practice. We know it by history records. Cruelty inflicts untold damage and pain, but it never prevails. It did not during World War II. It did not during the three long years of siege of Sarajevo and during the genocide in Srebrenica. It did not during the horrible massacres and massive ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. And we know all that all those who tried, those who suffer from the strong man syndrome, how they end it, at best behind bars. Bombing schools, hospitals, commercial centers, theaters and cinemas with modern weapons has killed many and terrified many more, but it has not demoralized nor broken Ukrainians. Instead, it has marked the Russian failure it, and it has sealed its humiliation. Ukrainians, men and women, are not fi fighting to survive, but to win, as they, and they will. Dear colleagues, no propaganda can beat facts. Half of the entire children of the country, of 44 million, are displaced. Nearly 4,500 residential buildings, over nine factories and enterprises, more than 650 educational establishments, 74 healthcare institutions have been damaged or destroyed in Ukraine. In Kharkiv alone, more than 1,000 houses have been destroyed by Russia. This extensive damage is not only the consequence, it is in fact the real aim of the aggressor. Unable to occupy the country, it is simply destroying it. Dear colleagues, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused major implications for food security across the world, as UN reports confirm it. It is inflicting severe challenges to developing countries. This comes when 2022 is believed to become a year of catastrophic hunger with more than 44 million people in 38 countries on the edge of famine and overall global needs for humanitarian assistance are higher than ever. People in conflict areas fear dying of war. Now they fear dying of hunger as well. This is another consequence of Russia's war. Dear colleagues, Troubling facts confirm that Russia has replaced the right of information with the freedom of disinformation. Novaya Gazeta, one of the largest independent investigative newspapers in Russia, led by Nobel Prize winner Dmitry Muratov, announced that it was forced to halt publication after being issued a warning from the government. You cannot tell the truth, they were told. You cannot speak of war. How many times have we heard in the most ridiculous posture that Ukrainians are inflicting all this to themselves. This is what Russians are told relentlessly now in an almost closed circuit information system. How masochist would they be, those Ukrainians, if it weren't for a simple fact? They have been aggressed in their home and they are fighting to defend it. Total information blackout will keep Russians into darkness burying them into a parallel and distorted reality through propaganda until mothers start looking for their missing boys. Dear colleagues, human, you and human rights team in Ukraine have received information about mass graves in the besieged city of Maripol. Other horrors will soon be unearthed. Everything must be done to ensure accountability of every war crime committed in Ukraine. The group of friends on accountability following the aggression in Ukraine recently established will support all efforts to gather evidence and document the atro atrocities of the war. Madam President, let me end with a reality check. Now we know Russia wanted all Ukraine. It learned the hard way it cannot and will not get it. Now it wants to divide it and grab a part. This must not be tolerated. It must be condemned and held accountable. And I thank you.
I thank the representative of Albania for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam President. La I'd like General, to thank the Assistant Secretary Joyce General Susuya, Joyce Masuya and the Deputy Executive Amir Director Abdullah of the WFP, Madam Joyce Masuya and collègues. Mr. La Abdullah, for their briefings. Mois. Colleagues, the terrain, war in Ukraine is now entering its second month, and on the ground, hostility is continuing, as is the ongoing exodus of civilians attempting to flee the combat zones. We are carefully following the evolution of the situation on the ground, and we are alarmed at the attacks against civilians, against civilian infrastructure, as well as those attacks that directly impact the supply of vital public services. The Red Cross data today indicates some 18 million people who need urgent humanitarian assistance in Ukraine, of which 900,000 could be rescued and welcomed by the UN and specialized agencies. The deterioration in living conditions, which goes hand in hand with an increase in health care needs, as well as needs for emotional and mental health care, are no doubt complicating matters when it comes to the modalities and nature of distribution of aid that needs to be brought urgently to thousands of people, both those who stayed in their country, as well as those who decided to flee the zones of combat in order to seek shelter. And we know that many of those fleeing are in majority women and children. We are concerned by persistent information indicating that there's a risk of disease stemming from the fact that it's difficult to have access to drinking water and clean infrastructure with the corollary of hygiene problems. The FAO data are also a source of concern because the FAO is predicting food shortages in the three months to come with some 40% of observed zones impacted due to harvest unpredictability especially. The risk of food shortages and food insecurity is at a world level Dans les régions du monde and this déjà is worse en à des in those areas that are already fragile, Sahel. such as the Sahel. Madame la Présidente, Madam President, de la solidarité beyond nous standing avons in solidarity, which we are standing with the Ukrainian people and all people who are facing distress, due to this war, de de beyond de the momentum of international solidarity, which has not wavered since the 24th of February, and which translated in particular to larger mobilization for humanitarian aid in Ukraine, and beyond words and condemnations, which we have heard before the world. It is beyond all of that. It is urgent that we respond to the distress of the Ukrainian people and all of those suffering at their side due to Mon pays the acts which are in proportion to the stakes. Ukraine, My country is of the view that the humanitarian issue in Ukraine sans politisation aucune. needs to be La grappled with in an isolated manner without any politicization of, of the issue. Politicization will just contribute to distancing the Council from its goal, which is to oversee the respect of international conventions and create respect, conditions of respect for the protection of civilians in war zones while providing access to humanitarian workers and without impediment in all security. This is the vocation of humanitarian law, and no doubt it is also important for other issues which are on the Council's agenda. Madam President, I'd like to reiterate my country's appreciation for the neighboring countries of Ukraine that continue to mobilize to urgently welcome the refugees, and we encourage them to continue granting the same welcome to all people suffering distress without distinction of origin or race including African students and citizens. We would ask for the respect of their dignity and we would call for an equitable treatment of all persons suffering from distress. We once again call on the warring parties to respect the provisions of international law and humanitarian law, specifically the Geneva Convention of 1949 and its additional protocols and guarantee the respect and protection of medical staff and humanitarian workers. We call on the parties to commit to opening humanitarian corridors that are secure, and we call for immediate cessation of hostilities. Dear colleagues, 
ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Comme le président français, Pierre Cornet, le doit cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de combattants. Le combat ne doit pas cesser par faute de
cannot become targets of attacks. In the same vein, parties must grant safe passage to relief consignments to those in need. <coughs> Excuse me. The situation in Mariupol is particularly concerning. We call on all parties to work towards concrete agreements to allow civilians to leave the city if they so wish. Parties should spare no efforts to prevent people from going missing and to share information on the status of protected persons under their control. Once again, Brazil reiterates the call for all parties to fully respect and ensure respect for international humanitarian law. No matter the causes of a conflict, once it erupts, civilians must be safe. The wounded must receive medical care. Humanitarian assistant, mu assistance must reach those in need. And detainees must be treated humanely in all circumstances. There must be no politicization of humanitarian messages, nor selective applications of international humanitarian law. Also, geopolitical objectives must not supersede the endeavor for peace, nor prolong the human suffering caused by war. Madam President, the forecasts of most humanitarian organizations were already catastrophic for 2022. This conflict, apart from the enormous human suffering and devastation caused in Ukraine, will have spillover effects on the entire world, making it, <clears throat> making it even more difficult to alleviate the dire situation of civilians in conflict-torn countries. The longer the conflict drags on, the higher the risk of further instability, hunger and devastation in Ukraine and elsewhere. It is high time to return to the path of dialogue and diplomacy for a peaceful settlement of the conflict. We urgently need the cessation of hostilities, de-escalation of tensions and negotiations are the only way out of this conflict, not only for the countries directly involved, but also for the whole world. I thank you. I thank the representative of Brazil for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Madam President. I thank SG Joyce Masuya and Executive Director Beasley for their briefings, which gave us a worrying account of the situation on the ground. The conflict situation in Ukraine is persisting. Effectively protecting civilian lives and meeting their humanitarian needs is a must. China calls for respect for international humanitarian law to avoid civilian casualties to the maximum extent, protect civilian facilities, provide safe passage for evacuation and humanitarian access, and ensure a continuous supply of basic necessities such as food, drinking water, and medicines. Protection of vulnerable groups such as women and children must be strengthened. We support agencies like OCHA and the WFP in upholding the principles of humanity, neutrality and impartiality as they continue to mobilize and coordinate international support to provide emergency humanitarian relief to conflict-affected populations and to help Ukraine and its neighboring countries meet the enormous humanitarian needs. Madam President, we must also be cognizant that the ever-escalating, sweeping, indiscriminate sanctions have hit global energy, food, economic and trade and financial markets and will continue to do so, affecting the life and livelihoods of the general public and giving rise to new humanitarian problems. Developing countries, which make up the majority of the world, are not parties to this conflict and should not be drawn into the confrontation and forced to suffer the consequences of geopolitical clashes and sparring among major powers. Right now, global 
global food security is being seriously challenged, which warrants due attention. Sanctions and economic blockades will only artificially exacerbate food shortages and price distortions, further disrupt food production and food supply chain across the world, push up food prices, and put such burdens on developing countries as they do not deserve. We call on we call for enhanced international coordination to stabilize food supply and food prices, refrain from unjustified export restrictions, keep the market working in a stable manner, and ensure global food security. The United Nations, the WFP, the FAO, the WTO, and other agencies should actively contribute to coordinating food production and trade among countries and help helping developing countries survive the shocks. Madam President, if the crisis continues and escalates, further damage is on its way, and it is not in the interest of any party. The most conclusive way towards a ceasefire to end the hostilities is dialogue and negotiation. The international community should encourage and support continued direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine until a positive outcome is achieved and peace is restored. Security is indivisible, and seeking absolute security by pitting one bloc against another is precisely the most assured way to achieve insecurity. The United, Na United States, NATO, and the EU should also engage in dialogue with Russia, accommodate the legitimate security concerns of all parties, and build a balanced, effective, and sustainable regional security architecture through dialogue and negotiation. China will continue to work towards and play a constructive role in easing the situation and resolving the crisis. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of China for their statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of the United Arab Emirates. I thank both the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Ms. Joyce Misua, and the Executive Director of the World Food Programme, Mr. David Beasley, for their valuable briefings. Each meeting and briefing that we hold on the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Ukraine underscores the war's devastating impact on the lives of civilians and the failure of the international community to alleviate their suffering. We are deeply concerned by the increasing casualties, destruction, and damage to civilian infrastructure. In particular, we deplore the rate of displacement, which has seen nearly a quarter of Ukraine's population, more than 10 million IDPs and refugees, most of whom are women and children, flee their homes in just one month of fighting. We reiterate the importance of an immediate cessation of all hostilities throughout Ukraine. We also welcome yesterday's request from the UN Secretary General that Martin Griffiths work with the parties involved to explore the possibility of humanitarian ceasefire in Ukraine. And we were pleased to hear today from OCHA that there was a positive response on both sides. We strongly support aid agencies as they uphold the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality and independence, and as they coordinate with all parties to ensure safe and unhindered access for humanitarian workers. In light of the dire situation, the UAE believes that it is important to focus on the following key points in order to help those in need most effectively. First, we commend the role of humanitarian organizations and OCHA in rapidly responding under extreme pressure to the needs of civilians. Their efforts during the conflict have made it possible to provide aid to nearly one million people. We also commend the push to develop an integrated system of aid operations throughout the country. We support OCHA's efforts to create a humanitarian notification mechanism for the safe delivery of aid. We would also like to see work done building on the UN's coordination with Ukraine and the Russian Federation, which led to humanitarian convoys delivering aid to Sumy and most recently Kharkiv. Second, the UAE reiterates the importance of all parties complying with international humanitarian law, especially to protect civilians, limit military operations to exclusively military objectives, and take all precautionary measures. We stress the need for keeping lines of communication open between all parties to coordinate the safe delivery of aid in a practical and effective manner, as well as following through on proposals for the dignified treatment of the dead so they can be identified have their families informed and their bodies returned on all sides. 
We further emphasize the importance of securing temporary ceasefire agreements in specific areas to allow civilians to evacuate to safety, to securely deliver aid to civilians in need, and to ensure the protection of humanitarian workers. Third, we call for intensifying diplomatic contacts between the two parties to find a peaceful solution, and we fully support all media mediation efforts in this regard. We took note of the positive reports from the talks conducted in Istanbul today, as well as other ongoing mediation efforts. It is our sincere hope that they will lead to a diplomatic solution. In this context, we also stress the important role of women in conflict resolution and peace negotiations, including here, to ensure their sustainability and durability. We should all be alarmed by the WFP's briefing today. As they note, Ukraine and Russia together are a critical breadbasket for the world. The rising food insecurity is wreaking havoc on pandemic recovery, particularly for developing, least developed and small island developing states. In the Middle East and Africa, the conflict jeopardizes significant sources of wheat, including for many countries on this council's agenda. This could lead to further unrest and instability around the world. In conclusion, the UAE reaffirms its commitments to the humanitarian response, which we have contributed to both bilaterally and through the UN's flash humanitarian appeal. We also reiterate the importance of constructive Security Council engagement towards alleviating the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine and more broadly to help encourage the urgent diplomatic resolution of this conflict. I now resume my function as President of this Council and Her Excellency Ms. Wendy Sherman, Deputy Secretary of State of the United States of America, has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give her the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity today. I much appreciate it, Madam President. Um, I feel that I must um, make uh, four critical points. Uh, first, I want to be clear that the conflict that is being suffered by the Ukrainian people is not about the Russian Federation versus the West. 140 countries just last week spoke in support of ending this conflict and the need to end this humanitarian crisis. 141 countries supported the initial resolution in the UN General Assembly to say that this invasion by Russia should stop. So with all due respect, uh, Mr. Ambassador, this is not about Russia versus the West. This is about the support of the UN Charter and the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the right of all countries, all countries, to choose their political orientation and their foreign policy. Second, I myself was engaged directly with Russian counterparts to find a peaceful way forward to meet the concerns of the Russian Federation. I sat opposite Russian counterparts and put on the table many options to address the concerns. We provided, as does NATO, a paper of very specific ways in which we could address reciprocally and mutually security concerns. President Putin chose an invasion not diplomacy. Third, with all due respect, Mr. Ambassador, as a Jewish American, I cannot help but say this is not about Nazis in Ukraine. Last week, former U.S. Secretary of State and former permanent representative to this council and one of my most cherished personal friends Madeleine Albright died. She loved representing the United States here. She would have been outraged by the words of the Russian Federation today. Later in her life, she learned that her parents raised her as Catholic to protect her from the Nazis because her family was Jewish. She learned that three of her grandparents died at the hands of the Nazis while in concentration camps. She knew that the Jewish president of Ukraine was certainly not a Nazi. 
and that the citizens of Ukraine being slaughtered and starving and without food and medicine and the subject of this humanitarian dialogue today are not and never were Nazis. And finally, this dialogue today is about the humanitarian needs of Ukrainian civilians and the humanitarian needs of people around the world who, as David Beasley said so eloquently, are going from feeding starving children, feeding hungry children, to feeding starving children. It's about, as he said, going from a bread basket to a bread line. We must all do whatever we can, of course, to stop war. But there is an easy choice here, and it is a choice that can be made today in Istanbul by President Putin, and that is to stop the war. So let us all, over 140 countries around the world, continue to stand with Ukraine. Thank you. I thank Her Excellency Ms. Sherman for her statement. And I'd like to give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation who has asked to make a further statement. I give them the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to respond to the statement of Ms. Sherman. I won't comment on the part about your participation in the negotiations. Of course, you're very well informed about this, much better so than I or my colleagues are. But because the negotiations did not succeed, then perhaps you fell short in some way in this area, and perhaps you should have worked better and uh, should have proposed more, made more serious proposals, but now we are where we are, and I'd like to comment on your words regarding Nazism in Ukraine. It has already become a common excuse when people say that the Ukrainian president is Jewish, so he can't be a Nazi. I won't try to convince you of the opposite. I'll just cite some facts. What do you think? You know who Stefan Bandera, Stefan Bandera was and Roman Chuhevich. You know how how many things these people did that were harmful, that were bad for humanity. These were people who collaborated with Nazis, who uh, took part in the killings of Poles, of Jews, of Russians, of Ukrainians. And if you have any doubts, ask the Polish people about this, not Polish politicians, but the ordinary people I've worked in. Poland for three years, and I'm very well aware of how they view Bandera there. Well, Bandera and Chukhevich are national heroes of Ukraine. And the national battalions in their insignia have Nazi symbols. Recently, NATO had to delete a portrait of a Ukrainian woman from its official page because there was a Nazi symbol on her uniform, uniform. of course. Of course, it doesn't mean anything if you just have these symbols. Of course, it doesn't mean anything if uh, your military tortures people and brands military uh, Nazi symbols on their bodies. You don't consider that to be Nazism. And if the president of a country considers the national hero of a country to be someone who fought alongside Hitler, killing Jews, Poles, Russians, and Ukrainians, well, apparently, from your point of view, this doesn't mean anything as well, but we see things otherwise, and so do the majority of the people in Russia and Ukraine. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Madam President, Distinguished uh, members of the Security Council, Assistant Secretary General, Executive Director Beasley, uh, 
I also recognize the representative of the aggressor state present here in the permanent seat of the Soviet Union, who is in fact is not authorized to speak on behalf of the Ukrainian people, as he just did. At the outset, I would like to inform you that the demilitarization of Russia conducted by the Ukrainian army and supported by the entire Ukrainian people is well underway. Since the beginning of the invasion, the Russian occupiers have lost more than 17,000 military personnel, more than 1,700 armored vehicles, almost 600 tanks, over 300 artillery systems, 127 planes, and 129 helicopters, almost 100 rocket launchers systems, 54 air defense systems, and seven ships. That is, under, uh, that is an unprecedented blow to Moscow, where the numbers of Soviet losses in Afghanistan pale in comparison. However, after listening to Russia's ambassador, I regret to say that the process of deputinization is lagging behind so far. Today's negotiations in Istanbul have demonstrated that Russia may be ready to make steps forward, although it is still a long way to a sustainable ceasefire and comprehensive de-escalation. The parties will continue consultations to prepare and agree on provisions of a treaty on the security guarantees for Ukraine, a mechanism of implementation of the ceasefire, withdrawal of forces, and other armed formations, opening and safe functioning of humanitarian corridors on a permanent basis, as well as on the exchange of fallen soldiers and the release of prisoners of war and civilians. Signing of the treaty on the security guarantees for Ukraine will only be possible after withdrawal of all Russian armed units to locations as on 20, 23rd February 2022. The negotiation process which is underway by no means removes the need to provide to Ukraine additional assistance with weapons and to implement new sanctions imposed on the Russian Federation for the act of aggression committed. Dear colleagues, last week, the overwhelming majority of the UN membership expressed once again its resolute stance towards Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of, in Ukraine. Strong humanitarian messages addressed to Russia left no room for misinterpretation and neither did attempts by the aggressor to shift responsibility on the victim. We demand that Russia immediately and unconditionally implement all provisions of the UN General Assembly Resolution ES 11-2, Humanitarian Consequences of the Aggression Against Ukraine, to alleviate humanitarian suffering on the ground. I regret to say that as of now, Russia demonstrates no willingness to give up its strategy of deliberate aggravation of the humanitarian situation on the ground. There is a clear nexus between the hard security, the humanitarian situation, and food security with regard to the Russian war against Ukraine. After the failure of its initial plan for Blitzkrieg, Russian troops have proceeded to Plan B. This plan envisages provoking humanitarian disaster throughout Ukraine and destroying the agricultural potential of my country to intimidate the Ukrainian political leadership and people and to incline them to surrender. The toolbox is broad and extremely cruel. It includes deliberate destruction of residential areas and critical infrastructure, missile shelling throughout the country, the besiege of cities, violation of arrangements on humanitarian corridors, terror against civilians in the occupied areas, including abductions and killings. 
As of now, the invaders abducted about 30 local leaders, activists, and journalists. It is hard to imagine that Russia fired 467 missiles at residential areas only, with the overall number being 1,200. This includes ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and supersonic missiles. This number has already made the Russian actions the heaviest missile shelling ever in such a short period of time. Mariupol remains a bleeding wound in the heart of Europe. According to the local authorities, at least 5,000 people were killed. Almost 150,000 residents remained under siege, deprived of any basic conditions to leave. They need to be evacuated, but not to the territory of the, of the aggressor. Russian attempts to do so are not only cynical hypocrisy, but a gross violation of the laws and customs of war, the norms of international humanitarian law, in particular the Geneva Convention of 1949 and additional protocol one to the Geneva Conventions. As now about 40,000 Ukrainians were forcibly deported to Russia and Belarus. At the same time, the Russian armed forces resort to firing at evacuation convoys trying to leave Mariupol for, non, for the non-occupied territory of Ukraine. According to, U, to UNICEF, one month of war in Ukraine has led to the displacement of 4.3 million children, more than half of the country's estimated 7.5 million child population, including more than 1.8 million children who left the country as refugees. At least 143 children were killed by Russian invaders and 216 injured. Humanitarian action is urgently needed. At the same time, we should bear in mind that the humanitarian disaster in Ukraine is an element of the Russian war strategy. To be efficient, any initiative should be focused on changing the overall Russian approach towards Ukraine instead of idle attempts to engage the aggressor as a partner on the humanitarian track. I also reiterate my call to, to join the group of friends of accountability following the aggression against Ukraine, which was launched last Friday and already includes almost 50 member states. Distinguished colleagues, the third element of the nexus, food security, is also under threat on the global level. We are aware that the entire world is deeply concerned over the disruption of food supplies from Ukraine as one of the major food exporters. Before the war, more than 55% of all sunflower oil in the world was exported from Ukraine. More than 55% of Ukrainian wheat was exported to Asia and 40% of Ukrainian wheat was exported to African states. About 400 million people throughout the world, mostly in the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia, depend on grain supplies from Ukraine. What we in Ukraine are also alarmed about is that 40 million Ukrainians may face food shortages already this year. This prompts the government of Ukraine to work intensively on both tracks to secure the country's export potential to the largest extent possible and to ensure that Ukrainians who bear the primary burden of Russia's aggression will not suffer from hunger. International solidarity with Ukraine and understanding that the only root cause of the current food crisis is Russia's war against Ukraine will be crucial to succeed in averting the worst case scenario on the global level. It is extremely important, therefore, not to spam our discussion with references to those issues that are not the root causes, but rather implications of Russia's ongoing violations. It must be clear that vulnerable countries will remain at risk as long as Russia continues its war in Ukraine. 
which includes shelling the agricultural infrastructure, contaminating the Ukrainian soil, deliberately targeting fuel storages, and thus disrupting the sowing and harvesting campaign. For instance, this weekend alone, Russian missiles hit fuel storages in Lviv, Dubno, Lutsk, and Rimne, all in the west of the country, far away from the front line. Just today, the Russian troops shelled with missiles a farm enterprise in Dnipro, also far away from the combat area, destroying vehicles and equipment. Perhaps the representative of the aggressor state could explain what the reason was for this attack, demilitarization or denazification. All Ukrainian seaports remain blocked by Russia, thus further aggravating the situation with supply shortages. Some of them have been occupied. The occupation and lifting the blockade could quickly improve the situation as 60% of agricultural products were exported by Ukraine through its seaports. Under these extraordinary circumstances, the government of Ukraine takes comprehensive measures to respond to food security challenges. The sowing campaign is due to start on 70% of agricultural lands. The government has also launched an in interest-free loan program for farmers to strengthen their capabilities against the, block drop, sorry, against the backdrop of the war. Steps to re reorient the supply chains by switching to safe routes are being taken as well. We are ready to discuss the food security issues in detail mm -hmm. with all interested actors. At the same time, however, we are not able to proceed to details in the presence of the representative of Russia, as food security, or rather food insecurity, has been and remains one of the main elements of Russia's military planning and it is actions on the ground. The Russian occupants act under the motto, the worse it is, the better. And it is highly likely that as soon as Moscow receives the report of the Russian ambassador, the list of Russian targets will be amended with new items. We do not want all Ukrainian black soils to be sown with mines and all agricultural infrastructure destroyed. In fact, Putin is not the first dictator to weaponize food against the Ukrainian nation. Moscow's ideological apostle Stalin killed millions of Ukrainians 90 years ago in the artificially organized Great Famine. It is not surprising, therefore, that Putin who venerates Stalin as his forefather, resorts to the same practice. Madam President, let me quote a written message recently conveyed from besieged Mariupol by one of its residents to his relative. I quote, Dima, mommy was killed on the 9th of March, 2022. She died very quickly. Then the house was burned down. Dima, forgive me that I did not protect her. I buried her near the kindergarten. End of quote. This written message with a makeshift map is a sign of several lives ruined by Russia. Several out of thousands in the, in the one city of Mariupol alone. Millions throughout Ukraine. This is the price for the war the world failed to prevent. This is the price for the sick mind of the Russian dictator and most of his people. Civilized nations tolerated it for so long in a naive hope that the Kremlin could stop at last. In the meantime, 
Russian society continues to remain in denial. However, as it happened after the defeat of Nazism, when its supporters were taken to the sites of Holocaust to break their denial and to open their eyes wide, the time will come when the supporters of Putinism will be taken to Ukrainian cities and villages, burned to the ground, to the mass graves of thousands of Ukrainians killed by the Russian invaders. I will conclude with quoting from today's video address of my president. I start the quote. The signals we hear from the negotiations can be called positive. But these signals do not drown out the ruptures of Russian shells. Ukrainians have already learned during these 34 days of invasion and over the past eight years of the war in Donbass that only a concrete result can be trusted." End of quote. And the lies poured out on us here like slop by Putin's representative is a vivid confirmation of this. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ukraine for their statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>